So now um, it's really my pleasure to introduce our presenters for this evening. We have Alexandra Gennaro and Megan Cote, who will be presenting this evening's topic on grief and loss. Alexandra is a registered social worker from our SNAP program team at Kinark, and she provides SNAP services, including group, individual, and family counseling through an evidence-based cognitive, behavioral, and family-focused model. If folks are wondering what SNAP stands for, it stands for, now I'm gonna test myself, Alexandra, uh, stop now and plan, is that correct? Yes, so that's our SNAP program that we have across all of our CYMH programs. And Megan is currently completing her Master of Social Work degree at the University of Toronto with a specialization in children and families. She has been a practicum student with KINARC in the York Complex Mental Health Program for the last six months. So it is my absolute pr pleasure to uh, welcome Alexandra and Megan into this evening's presentation to share with you a wonderful uh, presentation on grief and loss. Yes, thank you again, everyone, for being patient with our tech issues. Um, I know uh, Lex and I are very excited to present this evening and to uh, introduce the topic of grief. And we wanted to highlight that there is so much more to grief than what we're going to be able to capture in 90 minutes today. But the goal of today is to really just introduce the topic, normalize talking about grief, and to grow our understanding of grief. Uh, we also want to think about how loss impacts the children and youth that are in our life and what we as caregivers, family, or friends can do to support them. And as Joanne mentioned, we just wanted to highlight that this presentation will be recorded and shared with everyone after. So feel free to go back and watch it again um, and to access the resources that will be shared with you at the end of the presentation. So we're going to move now into our relaxation exercise. And, and so the goal with this is to really enter into a rest and digest mode where we feel calm and our muscles are relaxed. These two techniques, so we have box breathing, which is the one on the left, and five finger breathing, which is the one on the right, are really two simple and quick exercises that we can do independently or with the children and youth in our lives to help teach them how to regulate their emotions. And so you can do either of these um, for this exercise today. And if you choose to do the box breathing, um, you can either like imagine a box or you can trace a box on like a surface in front of you. And we're going to rotate uh, through a series of inhaling, holding our breaths and exhaling and repeating that for two to three um, times. And if you choose to do the five finger breathing, you can just hold your hand out and just start at the base of your thumb like down here and just trace your fingers. So when you're going upwards, this is when you'll be inhaling. And when you go down, this is when you'll be exhaling and just continuing um, tracing all the fingers on your hand until you reach the end. And so I would like to invite everyone now just to get into a relaxed position and to take a moment to notice how we're feeling um, and to ground ourselves. We might be feeling a little nervous or in a heightened state um, due to the topic that we we're discussing today. And I'd also invite you to reflect on how you're feeling after we complete the exercise to see if you've noticed any um, tension that's been reduced or maybe feeling a little more grounded. So I'm gonna be following the box breathing during this exercise. So uh, we can begin with just taking in a breath for a count of four. So one, two, three, four, holding that breath. One, two, three, four. And now exhaling. One, two, three, four. And holding. One, two, three, four, and breathe in again, one, two, three, four, and hold, one, two, three, four, and breathe out, one, two, three, four, and hold that breath for one, two, three, and four. So you can take a deep breath in and whenever you're ready, if you had your eyes closed, you can open. Um, and again, I would just like to invite you to reflect on, on how you're feeling now and noticing any changes you may feel. And I'll hand it over to Lex. 
Awesome. I know that I definitely appreciated that. Thank you, Megan, um, helping me feel calm and grounded in this moment. Um, so we're going to start off by giving some um, definitions around grief. Um, some of these terms we're going to use throughout the presentation. So we just want to make sure that everyone has a good understanding of these terms. So grief is our internal experience and reaction to loss. It's what we think and feel on the inside. So for example, some people may feel um, numb, angry, anxious, or relieved, or even multiple of these emotions at the same time. Mourning, on the other hand, is how we express and communicate those emotions outside of ourselves. So it's the way that we publicly express our loss. The way that we mourn is highly influenced by our beliefs, our religion, and cultural context. So for example, in European American culture, parents often try to protect their children from talking about death. Whereas in Mexican culture, death is openly celebrated and embraced and young children participate in annual death rituals at a young age, including Day of the Dead, which provides socialization opportunities that influence children and youth's understanding of death. Of course, we don't want to paint everyone with the same brush, so not Every European American tries to protect their children from talking about death, and not every Mexican participates in Day of the Dead rituals. These are just some examples of how culture may play a role in the way that individuals experience grief. Um, it's also important to note that mourning a death is not always easy, so many people tend to be uncomfortable with that outward expression of grief. We sometimes might feel ashamed or weak if we show our emotions but when in reality, it takes strength to mourn and show those emotions. So it's important to mourn because we move toward integrating the loss into our lives, not just by grieving, but through that mourning experience as well. The next term on the slide is bereavement. So that just is simply the objective situation of loss that has occurred. It's also important to highlight that when we think about grief, we often think about the death of a person or pet that we have a significant relationship with. However, people can experience grief before or after any important loss that affects their life. So that might include the loss of a child's family or home, uh, for example, being placed in foster care, or the loss of relationships like parental separation or divorce, um, relocating to a different school and losing friendships, the loss of a job, the loss of a body part or a physical ability, and many other losses that are significant to the person based on their individual perception of loss. There's also the term disenfranchised grief, which is used to explain a loss that isn't openly acknowledged or publicly supported. So for example, some people may minimize the loss of a job or a pet or a friendship um, as something that's not quote unquote worth grieving over. Taboo causes of death that are stigmatized like suicide, drug overdose, miscarriages, and others are also considered to be experiences of disenfranchised grief. So for the purpose of this pre presentation, we're going to focus on the way that children and youth are impacted by a bereavement experience of death of people or pets. However, I want you to keep in mind how their grief may be complicated or intensified by multiple experiences of grief. So there are two types of losses, primary and secondary. The primary loss is the loss that occurs first or that major loss. So for example, that might be a death. Um, and for others, that might be re relocating to a new school or the diagnosis of an illness. Um, the secondary losses are those that occur as a result of the major loss. So they're not necessarily any less impactful or difficult or important than the primary loss. These losses can unfold over time and they can also become apparent immediately after the death or loss. So for example, if a parent is diagnosed with a chronic illness, they may continue to work until they're no longer able to. And that fear of loss of financial security might begin when they were diagnosed and unfold over time as they become closer to that last, last day of work for them and for their family as well. Secondary losses are a normal part of grief and identifying them can be really important in that first step of grieving them. So Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was a psychiatrist in the study of death and dying. And in the 1960s, uh, death and dying were taboo subjects and sometimes still are. And she opened the doors to conversations about death as well as grief and loss. She originally created this model, the five stages of grief that you can see here in the image um, for the psychological coping of adults who were dying from a terminal illness. And this model was later applied more generally to people who experience grief and loss of a family member. 
So again, these stages have been considered the hallmark for understanding the experience of death and dying. We have uh, the first stage listed there, denial and isolation. So difficulty understanding the loss and grasping the reality that death is going to happen or has happened. Some people might be in a state of shock or numbness to the emotional outcome of loss. Isolation or withdrawal might also occur as a behavior response in this stage. In the anger stage, um, people may experience anger over the terminal diagnosis or the loss. In this stage, people often feel that it's unfair that this has happened to them. Then we have the bargaining stage. So the person attempts to strike a deal with a higher being to postpone the death. So, so for example, they might secretly pray or promise to be good in exchange for more time on earth or more time with the person who has been diagnosed with an illness. Depression is defined as a sense of great loss where people may struggle to find the meaning of life or the meaning of the loss. And then we have acceptance. So the individual has resolved their feelings of anger and sadness. They're not necessarily content that they have experienced a loss or um, will experience a loss, but they either await that death with a quiet expectation or they move forward with meaning from their experience of loss. Um, and in this stage, individuals may also experience an absence of emotion and be void of feelings. So originally these stages of grief were understood as a linear pathway, but with more and more research, we now understand that grief is more complex than that. So we're not necessarily moving from denial to acceptance, but we might be moving um, from stage to stage, back and forth, and in a circular motion. So there's this metaphor for from the Grief Out Loud podcast that really resonates with me, and I'd like to share because it may also resonate with you, uh, where they described grief as a spiral staircase because the experience can, of grief can be like you're taking steps forward, and sometimes it can feel like you're circling back to the beginning and nothing has changed. So if this is your experience, that's okay. You're not alone in this experience. You're just circling back and revisiting the stages with new awareness and new skills, and it will feel like you're moving forward again. So while sometimes that spiral staircase can be exciting, sometimes they can also be disorienting and you may have to slow down and grab onto that handrail. So grief can really be both of these things. These stages are also meant to be descriptive and not prescriptive. So all of the stages of grief are only descriptions of what people might experience. They shouldn't be used as a way to define someone's recovery process, but rather as a way to help support them and others around them understanding what they might be going through in that grief experience. While this model was originally created based on adults' experiences, it also helps us understand similarities and differences during the grief process that children and youth experience. So for example, younger children tend to have higher levels of separation distress, where they engage in yearning and searching behaviors. So that might look like crying, rocking, temper tantrums, maybe waiting by the door for the person to return. And when they're unsuccessful in finding that connection that has been lost, this often leads to the stage of anger. Adolescents, on the other hand, tend to have higher levels of identity distress or existential distress. So they might be thinking, why did this happen to me? What is my future gonna look like now? Um, and they may experience that depression stage more intensely compared to children. And one more thing that I want to highlight on this slide is that the experience of grief really evolves over a person's lifetime and is experienced with new levels of awareness. So as children and youth re-experience the loss as they progress through the stages of de development, which we will get to um, in a couple minutes. During the process. So the quote here is a representation of how we experience the process of grief unfolding. It's a quote from Nora McHenry, who has experienced loss through two pregnancies, the loss of her father, the loss of her husband. And in a TED talk, she shared that we need to help each other to remember that grief is this multitasking emotion, that you can and will be sad and happy. You'll be grieving and able to love in the same breath. We need to remember that a grieving person is going to laugh again and smile again. Absolutely, they're gonna move forward, but that doesn't mean that they've moved on. So when we hear people say it's time to move on, that can be dismissive because it's natural for us to want to continue to have a relationship with the deceased. So saying um, moving on gives us that message that the person or the furry family member's life, death and love 
are just moments that we can leave behind us and that we probably should in order to have a happy and meaningful life. Um, so we want to get away from that idea and rather than saying move on, we might consider saying move with and move through with the support of others. The image on the right hand side is another representation of this idea of what we can experience during the grief process. So the idea was created by a woman in a grief workshop in 1996, and she experienced the death of her child and she created a sketch with three images of how she expected her grief to progress versus how it actually progressed. So this image is a modification of her perception. She drew a circle and fully shaded it in which represented that at the time of her loss, her whole life was consumed by grief. She drew another circle of the same size and she shaded in a much smaller portion. And that represented that she expected her life to stay the same size and for her grief to shrink as time had passed. She then drew a third image of what actually happened as time passed, which is represented by that bottom row there. So um, rather than grief shrinking over time, she found that her grief, the shaded portion, stayed the same size and her life, that black outer line, grew bigger around it um, as time had moved on or moved forward. Sorry to correct myself. Um, so although some people tend to think that grief shrinks over time or we just move on from our grief, what really happens is our grief stays the same size and we grow around our grief. We learn to live with it and our life grows with and around it. So while our grief is always there and we will still spend time within it, our lives slowly expand around our loss and we learn to move with and through it, as well as experience life around it. Jay, we may need your assistance with uh, unmuting Megan. Thank you. Um, I won't mute myself again to avoid that from happening. Um, so thanks, Lex, for that uh, introduction into grief. And so for the next couple of slides, we're going to focus on some myths that we commonly hear um, in society around grief. So one that's common is that the pain of the loss will go away faster if I ignore it. And the fact is trying to ignore your pain may only make it worse in the long run. And it's it can be really important and helpful in your grief process to acknowledge those feelings um, to help you get a better understanding of what your grief looks like for you and what it feels like for you. Another myth is that it's important to be strong in the face of the loss. And so feeling sad, feeling frightened, angry, or lonely are all really normal um, reactions to loss. And we're going to touch on this later in the presentation, but there are some gender differences and grieving. And so Oftentimes, um, males may feel that they need to be strong because they don't want to appear weak um, in expressing those emotions. But there's a variety of emotions that people may feel when they're grieving, and um, they're all normal to experience. Another myth is that grief should last about a year. So there really is no roadmap for grief. Everyone's journey is different. And like Lex touched on, um, grief is not a linear journey. And so you, there's no real expectation for how long a grief um, may last. Another myth that we commonly hear is that if children are not visibly grieving, then they aren't grieving. And the fact for that one is that grieving is an internal response and mourning is the external response. So a children, or sorry, a child or a youth may still be feeling and grieving internally, but they may just not be expressing that um, externally. Another myth is that children are too young to attend rituals. And so children can participate in rituals, but they shouldn't be forced to participate in them. And nor should they be forced to talk about the deceased. And so this is where having conversations with children and seeing what their understanding is of grief and the loss that they're experiencing and just how they're feeling in general can be very uh, beneficial and providing them with the choice um, to if they would like to attend rituals or not can be helpful for them. And the last one is that people can help by not bringing up this subject. 
And so the fact of that is that people who are grieving often struggle to find people um, who are willing to talk to them about their grief and their experience. And so if you are supporting a child or youth or really anyone in your life, um, asking open-ended questions and sharing memories of their loved one can be helpful. And even if you don't have your own memories of their loved one, asking them to share those memories um, can be really impactful during their grief process. So as we've kind of discussed so far, grief is really um, an individual and personal experience. So over the next couple of slides, we're just going to touch on some developmental um, differences in children and youth in the way that they process grief and understand grief. So for children um, ages like zero to eight, death is really seen as temporary. So they do believe that their loved one is going to return and that they may see them again. And with infants, they may be expressing a lot of searching and seeking behaviors as they're trying to find where this attachment figure has gone. Uh, we may see some rocking or irregular sleeping behaviors and as well as those anxious behaviors. So that, that might be related to that searching and seeking. But infants do have an, a really strong ability to form new attachments, uh, which is seen as a strength as they may have lost um, an important attachment figure at such a young age. And again, with uh, children ages two to four, death is still considered temporary. So again, they expect this loved one to return. And their primary expression is typically play at this age. And so they may be um, digging holes and burying items in those holes, or you may see just a lot of enactment of death in their play. And so noting that this isn't uncommon and it's not necessarily unhealthy, um, Again, at a developmentally appropriate level, having conversations with these young kiddos and just seeing um, how they're feeling and, and what they're making sense of with their grief. Um, they may also be asking a lot of repetitive questions. And so they may be wondering if death happens to everyone. Um, they may be think, asking things such as, you know, when will um, my mom, for example, return? Uh, will you die too? What about me? And so really having the patience to sit um, with these young children and to answer these questions uh, can be really important as they're very curious in exploring this new uh, new topic for them. And children may also have some regressive behaviors and may require some help with tasks that they've already learned. So we may see some more bedwetting, thumb sucking. Um, if they know how to tie their shoes or put their shoes on, they may be asking for help with this. And so just knowing that this may be in relation um, to their grief. And with children ages five to eight, again, death is still seen as temporary with this age stage. And they may uh, believe that they're somehow responsible for the death that's occurred. So for example, um, a young child may have wished their loved one to be like dead out of anger, and they may now be blaming themselves because their wish came true. So um, an example of that may be that a child wanted to go to like a sleepover, um, over the weekend with her friends and then uh, she got grounded let's say and out of anger said like dad I just wish you were dead so I could go to my sleepover um, and then unfortunately several months or however long after um, dad has passed away so the child may now actually be thinking that they were the reason that their dad passed away and so when having these conversations around death, it's really important to explain um, the cause of death. You don't need to include like any specific, sorry, explicit details about the death, um, but just giving them a general understanding so that they know they were not the reason that their um, loved one has died. And in those conversations, using concrete language. So using things such as like daddy's heart stopped working. Um, and using the words dead and died, this can be intimidating as, you know, the words kind of seem scary and you're talking to uh, young children about it, but it is very helpful so that um, they get or try to develop an understanding that death is permanent and trying to avoid euphemisms in these conversations as well. So trying to avoid saying like daddy's on vacation or daddy's gone or daddy's lost as this um, may leave the chance for the child to think that they're going to return because typically when people go on vacation or they're lost they return home so um 
just having those conversations, making them concrete and trying to avoid euphemisms can be beneficial with this age group and really with any age group as well. And with children aged nine to 12, this is when they begin to um, see death as permanent and they start to think really abstractly and think about how this loss may be affecting them over the course of time. And so like young children, nine to 12 year olds may also have feelings of regret and guilt, which may lead them to believing that their thoughts and actions have made the death happen. And so youth at this age may really just appreciate if you just listen and validate and acknowledge what they're going through and try to avoid giving advice unless they ask for it. Um, grief is a really individual experience. And so just listening and um, validating what they're feeling is enough to make them feel supported at times. And as with any child or youth, it's important to talk to any external supports that that child may have. So um, maybe reaching out to teachers or their schools if they have coaches, um, just to see if there's any extra supports that may be available to them during this difficult time. And with um, teenagers age 13 to 18, again, this uh, age stage does see death as permanent and they do have that abstract thinking as well. And so ways that we can support um, teenagers is by really maintaining routines and setting clear expectations, but also being flexible with that when it's needed. And so, for example, you may have a youth um, who wakes up one morning and just says, I don't want to go to school. And so sitting with them and trying to get a better understanding of why they don't want to go to school. So maybe it's their grief or maybe there is something happening at school that's deterring them from wanting to go. Um, but really trying to get a better understanding of what support they need that day, what that support looks like, and if you are that support system for them. Um, it is really important for children and youth to maintain and continue their regular activities uh, that they had before the loss, but it's just as important to validate and acknowledge that they did just lose someone or maybe their pet um, and that their grief and what they're feeling may be heavier today than it was yesterday. Grief does ebb and flow, so those feelings come and go, and they may just be having stronger feelings about that today. And when it's possible, providing uh, the teen with choices. So if you'd like to create a ritual for their loved one, um, asking like, I'd like to do something to honor your dad's birthday. Would you like to be a part of that? And leaving the choice up to them if they want to participate in it or not. Um, but that really gives them the autonomy to make that choice. And as well as... Um, it's also been found that children and youth who do experience the death of a parent um, during or a loved one during their childhood are at an increased risk for suicide or suicidal ideation, um, especially when the parent or their loved one died of suicide. And so some common behaviors to look out for are an increased risk taking behaviors, social detachment, so that could be feelings of not belonging or withdrawing from society, as well as increased or new substance use. And as well as we wanted to highlight that adults also experience a variety of symptoms while grieving and some common behaviors, maybe some searching behaviors or dreams where they believe that they're seeing their loved one. Um, it's been, adults have reported like walking down the street and thinking that they saw the person they've lost or when they're driving. And once they realize that their loved one has died, sometimes these searching behaviors may decrease in symptoms such as depressed moods, anger, guilt, uh, difficulty concentrating, among uh, others, may arise. And some adults also experience intense yearning and longing for the person who has died. So grief is, like I've kind of said, a really individual experience, and it's a really unique experience. And so um, it may impact a child or youth or even yourself, um, your mental health. And so anxiety is very common for children and youth to experience after a loss, as they may feel other losses are going to continue to happen. And the death of a loved one may increase um, pre-existing anxiety or new anxiety may develop. And as there's been a really big change in their life and there may be a lot of unknowns. And so some children may be experiencing physical symptoms that relate to the way their loved one has died. So for example, if the loved one passed away of a heart attack, they may come to you complaining about chest pain. Um, and so just knowing that this may be 
related to an increase in anxiety or the development of new anxiety and experiencing those physiological symptoms for the first time. And so really just validating and again, acknowledging what they're feeling um, may allow them to feel supported and may lessen feelings of like fear or being scared. Um, that can be beneficial in supporting them. And to help the child or youth that you are caring for, it's helpful to understand and uh, know your own grief and your own worries and what that might look like for you. So checking in with yourself and ensuring that your physical care is being taken care of, so that you're hydrating and that you're eating. We acknowledge this can be hard um, as a caregiver, as there's a lot of responsibilities um, but you'll be able to best take care of the children and youth in your life if you're also taking care of yourself. Another uh, mental health impact uh, may be PTSD, which stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is a mental health condition that can develop when a child experiences a traumatic event. And so a traumatic event could be a single event, like something um, such as a car accident, or it can also be over a longer duration of time. So this would be things such as abuse, neglect, or reoccurring violence. And not all children who go through an upsetting event will experience this as trauma. And this is because different kids may perceive and react to events in different ways. However, if a child is still struggling one month after the event, then they may be experiencing PTSD. So like anxiety, um, a child or youth may have depression before the loss occurred, or it could be a result of the loss. But in both cases, grief can really intensify those feelings of depression. And after a death occurs, uh, children and youth may start to feel intense sadness or a desire to reunite with their loved ones. And they may also be expressing feelings of numbness, hopelessness. Uh, they may have a loss of interest or motivation in daily activities. They may also be experiencing some sleep disturbances. So that could be troubles falling asleep or staying asleep. And the symptoms of grief and depression are really similar that it's often um, times hard to distinguish between the two and determining um, what you, the child and youth may be feeling or what yourself may be feeling. So some key factors to consider when differentiating between grief and depression is that depression may not always have a cause and that the feelings of depression may not always be constant, but they may be present for longer periods of time than the symptoms of grief. So with depression, it may be feeling that for months or for weeks and possibly years. Um, whereas with grief, there's almost always an identifiable cause. They've lost a loved one or they've lost a pet. Um, and the feelings of grief tend to ebb and flow. So they come and go and they're often associated with positive memories of that loved one. And again, it's important to note that adults who are grieving may also express express or experience these depressed moods, uh, the numbness, shock, anxiety, and irritability. So again, just checking in with yourself and being aware of your grief um, may help you in being able to better support a child or youth in your life. So the last mental health impact that we're going to touch on today is prolonged grief disorder. And so this is characterized by intense longing for the loved one, a really intense pain, or becoming preoccupied with the loved one's death and difficulties accepting the death. And so the difference between grief and prolonged grief is that the symptoms start to interfere with daily functioning and become really overwhelming for the individual. And to get diagnosed with prolonged grief disorder, the death of a loved one must have occurred at least six months ago for children and adolescents, but more than a year for adults. And among children and adolescents who have lost a loved one, approximately 5 to 10% will experience depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and or prolonged grief disorder. And so, you know, this is a lot of information. So why are we telling you this and why is this important to know? And so it's important because... Um, these similars may, sorry, these symptoms may be similar and they may also overlap 
uh, with the symptoms of a different mental health concern. So being able to reflect on your grief experience or help a child and youth reflect on their grief experience um, and determining if it's having a profound impact on their life or your life is important and being able to notice the behavioral changes so that if and when you do seek uh, support, you're able to communicate these observations with either your family doctor or a psychiatrist or psychologist. So the circumstances in which a loved one dies has been shown to impact children and youth in a variety of ways. So violent deaths have been shown to increase anxiety, depression, and maladaptive grief. And children who witness violent deaths may also suffer from reoccurring intrusive images. And this may impact their ability to recall positive experiences with their loved one. Again, this isn't the case with every child, but it is just something to note and as well as anticipated deaths. So these are deaths that a child or a family um, are expecting to happen. So this is usually like chronic related illnesses or illness related deaths. And oftentimes we think that when a death is anticipated that it's easier for the child or youth to process. And so this isn't necessarily true as anticipated um, deaths can be just as distressing for children because of and youth because of their limited ability to understand um, the physical and cognitive changes that are often present with um, illness-related deaths. And so this is also dependent on what a child or youth is exposed to during this time as every child and youth is exposed to different things. Um, but seeing their loved one get progressively worse. So the cognitive decline. So maybe um, the loved one is no longer able to, to feed themselves or to make drinks for themselves or to, um, they may have a loss of mobility and there may be frequent hospital visits. So again, just checking in with the child or youth um, for both scenarios, both violent deaths and anticipated deaths to see how they're doing and um, their understanding of the loss. And so, as I mentioned earlier, um, it has been found that there are some gender differences in grief. So we have the feminization of grief and masculine grief, but it's important to note that um, these results are not inclusive to all gender identities. And so feminine grievers are those that are more likely to really seek out social supports and connections and wanting to talk about their grief. So they may be telling their story kind of over and over again. And this might be because they're they are emotional and they're trying to actively work on dealing with their grief. And by doing this, it may help them feel heard and supported. And with masculine grievers, um, it may be characterized as feeling invisible, misunderstood, or unwanted. And this often leaves the person to deal with their grief by themselves. And this may be because they're fearful of being embarrassed or shamed while in a vulnerable condition. So this goes back to the myth at the beginning um, of wanting to appear strong in the face of the loss. Um, and this is where this, with men, it may come in that they don't wanna show those emotions and be vulnerable. Um, so it's really an independent experience for masculine grievers, and they really try to focus on fixing their problem of grief. And as you can see on the screen, there is the term intuitive grievers and instrumental grievers. And so these are some newer terms um, that researchers are trying to use to remove the gender like assignment to the process of grief. And just because you, I, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so Intuitive grievers would be those similar to feminine grievers and instrumental grievers would be um, similar to masculine grievers. And just because we wanted to highlight just because you identify as a male or a female does not mean you're going to be an intuitive or an instrumental griever. Again, grief is a very personal experience. It's um, very unique. And so just being able to determine how you grieve can help you deal more effectively with your grieving process as you navigate your loss. And it may also be helpful to know as it may impact the services that yourself or the child and youth are receiving. And if you are an instrumental griever or know an instrumental griever, um, encouraging them to seek a support system, even if it's just one person, um, so that they can just share how they're feeling and that they don't need to fix their problem. 
And gender is just one factor that can determine the grieving process, but it does not determine the way in which someone will grieve. And there are other factors such as culture, socialization, birth order, and temperament that may also impact the grieving process. And so like I mentioned, um, culture and race are two other factors that may impact the grieving uh, process. And what is seen as normal or appropriate length of time for grieving also varies based on cultures and locations. And so, for example, um, in Hindu families, it's often common for relatives and friends to join together and support the family in a 13 day ritual. And in Jewish observances, they have customs to treat the body with the utmost respect. So generally, autopsies are not performed as it may be viewed as very disrespectful or disruptive to the body. And so Alicia Fournier is a grief specialist and educator, and she's been asked, why do you think people of color need different support through grief? Isn't death the one thing that impacts us universally? And Alicia often responds by saying that, yes, we all share the experience of grief, but people of color can grieve differently. And people of color and those with marginalized identities often grieve a loss of hope and safety in addition to someone's life. So while most individuals get the privilege of grieving in private, many people of color are forced to witness and process their loss in front of the world. And that's often on display for everyone to see. And so grief is not a new experience for Black, Indigenous, or other people of color. And with the last couple of years and the increasing amount of public deaths and the identification of unmarked graves for Indigenous communities, um, it has prompted them to seek support that acknowledge and serves the uniqueness of their identities and their cultural practices. And Alicia states that it's important to find spaces where everyone feels safe expressing their grief, and these spaces may look different for communities of color. So if you identify as a person of color or are seeking supports for a child or youth with um, a marginalized identity, just acknowledging that they may require more unique supports that do acknowledge their identity and cultural practices. So now that we have all this information about how grief impacts children and youth, we're going to move into some ways that we can support them. Again, I want to highlight that I know this is a lot of information to take in at all at once. We're learning about the different ways you can experience grief, the different factors that impact grief, and now we're going to go through many different resources. So I just want to remind everyone it's going to be posted on our website. We're going to send out some resources. So don't feel like you need to memorize everything right away. If you are feeling overwhelmed or heightened, feel free to take a moment and go back to that breathing exercise and um, the one that we did in the beginning and use that as an opportunity to ground yourself as we continue to move through this presentation. So here are a list of some parenting strategies that we can use within the home. First, it's important to create a consistent routine to reestablish safety and predictability. Since a loss has created a sense of uncertainty, it can be especially helpful to create a sense of predictability around starting and ending the day with our morning and nighttime routines. Setting limits but being flexible when needed is also helpful. So for example, we can say something like, would you like to clean your room this evening or tomorrow morning? So even when there are times where completing a task is not a choice, they're going to have to complete um, cleaning their room. So we can still be flexible by giving them a choice on when that task can be completed. We also want to provide many opportunities for big energy and play. We know that this is important developmentally for children ages two to four because they can communicate through play. However, it's equally as important for all children and youth, um, even those who are 13 to 18, they also need opportunities to just be a teen by engaging in fun or some relaxing activities. Since we know that grief increases children and youth's concerns of safety and abandonment, it increases um, potentially anxiety and that yearning and searching for attachment. So even with older children who um, might display regressive behaviors as well. So it's important to offer lots of physical and emotional nurturance during that time. We want to be prepared for repetitive questions, especially among children ages two to four, and to engage in fact checking with youth ages 13 to 18, who might be embarrassed to ask questions um, if they feel like they should know the answer. We want to provide a variety of, of expression, including talk, art, physical activity, play, writing, 
to really help support them to find what modality works well for them. We can also model appropriate expressions of grief and ways to take care of yourself because children and youth are often learning how to handle their own grief by observing their caregiver's behavior. So that might look like taking some deep breaths, eating healthy meals, going for walks, along with many other coping skills. So we included communication strategies because often parents and caregivers have the question, how do I talk to them about death? I like to share one of my favorite quotes by Dr. Wendy Harpham, uh, the greatest gift you can give your children is not protection from change, loss, pain, or stress, but the confidence and tools to cope with all that life has to offer them. So I have no doubt that you're all here today because you care deeply about the kiddos in your life that you want to support. So supporting them by being present with them, having open communication, and teaching coping, coping skills are ways that we can support them on their long-term journey with grief, rather than just protecting them from the pain in the moment. So these communication strategies here are combined from resources from the Dougie Center, kidsgrief.ca, and the Children's Grief Foundation. So I definitely recommend that you check out those websites for more information and suggestions. First, it's important to be a good listener by using active listening and paraphrasing. So you can give reassurance by letting them know that grief is unique and there's no one right way to grieve. So asking open-ended questions, including what is it like for you and listening without judgment gives them opportunity to ask questions they didn't know how to ask. We can also use fact checking. Uh, so for example, do you have questions about the process of getting ashes? That's especially important for youth ages 13 to 18, who again might present more mature and has having a better understanding of what is happening. So this really gives them that opportunity to ask questions when they might feel embarrassed to do so. It's very important to explain the death honestly using concrete language. So for example, mommy died, her body and her heart stopped working. And um, you can even share that when a person dies, they no longer breathe, think or feel anything. It's important to use the words death and died and to avoid those euphemisms such as gone or passed on because that can be confusing and they may have thoughts like, okay, well, they're gone for now. When are they coming back? So this is a helpful strategy, even for children who may see, see death as temporary. When we talk about honesty, if uh, people are telling children and youth part of the truth or aren't being clear with them, children can fill in their own blanks. So sometimes that can add guilt onto them. They might start to think that it's their fault. Maybe it was something that they did. Uh, so for example, I was mean to my parent, I stressed them out and that's why they had a heart attack and died. Many children don't share these thoughts and worries even with those who they're closest to. So we really want to address these concerns by giving those short, clear and honest explanations about the death and that they're not responsible for it. Honesty and transparency are also important uh, when it comes to creating a comfortable and safe environment. So when we aren't honest with the children and youth, sometimes they don't communicate about their grief because they think maybe their parents or caregivers don't know the information, so they're actually trying to protect them. So for example, there was a child in a support group who shared, my sibling died by suicide, but don't tell my parents because they think it was an accident. So it's important to hear about the truth from the caregivers so they know there is a safe space to talk about this experience. Children may also feel more comfortable talking with those who they aren't close with, so they don't have to worry about protecting the feelings of their caregivers or siblings. But another way that we can work on creating a comfortable and safe environment is by sharing, I might cry and it's not your fault, you're not making me cry. I just really miss dad too and these tears are okay. Avoid giving advice, again, unless they ask for it. Um, and ensuring that others in their circle of support have information so they can approach others, um, which is especially important for youth ages 13 to 18 who begin to rely more on peer support. I want to emphasize as well that it is important to have balance and communication about the death and the grieving process, as well as with normalcy. So in support groups, there have been youth who have identified strong feelings of wanting to feel and be seen as a normal teen. They have expressed things like, I don't want to just be that kid whose dad died. So while it's important to often communicate and check in with our kiddos and youth on how they're coping, it's just as important to have opportunities to be a normal kid by participating in play activities, fun family events, or routines and even rules um, that have 
balance between grieving and moving forward with their grief. And lastly, I wanna highlight that most likely you are all dealing with your own grief and other stressors. So sometimes we can get caught up in being the perfect caregiver or parent, um, and especially when there are so many different messages from society on what we should be doing. So being kind and forgiving to yourself and others is super important. We are not perfect and families are not perfect and everyone makes mistakes. So acknowledging this and giving yourself permission to make mistakes and being able to address those mistakes later on can really address some of that guilt that you might experience. So again, be kind of forgiving to yourself and know that you're on your own journey of figuring out what works for you and your family. So I'm gonna go through some online resources. So this one here, um, I really appreciate it is best suited for children aged six to 12, but it may also be helpful for children younger or older. You know your children best, so I encourage you to review the workbook in advance. That way you can familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with the content to see if you think this would be a good fit for them. And um, as well as if they have questions about it or how to navigate it, either on their own or with your help, you can really support them through that process. In this workbook in particular goes through uh, making sense of changes. So for example, they explore how the person changed before they died and how these changes or worries they may have um, make their body feel different too. It also explores changes in their mind. So for example, headaches, feeling foggy and recognizing thoughts. So anything that they wonder or worry about or hope for, they can really explore what's going on in their mind. They also explore different ways of coping and making a plan. So it allows them to try out different coping strategies and change their plan as they, they need to. It also explores feelings and how to talk about grief. So they include tips and in finding the right words to say when you uh, don't know what to say or do you, you don't wanna upset others. It gives those, those suggestions and um, answers as well to some of the questions that they might have. One thing that I appreciate about this workbook as well is that it encourages the individuals to express through words or drawing and being as creative as they wanna be. So that gives them opportunity to make choices and express through a variety of different ways. You can also do all the activities or you can choose the ones that make sense to you and you can do them in any order. So give, again, giving people choice and allowing them space to grieve in their own unique way. There's also two similar workbooks on the same website, kidsgrief.ca, located at the bottom of the screen there. Um, so there's one called My Life, Their Illness, and that's for young people who have someone in their life with a serious or life-threatening diagnosis. And they have another workbook called Medical Assistance in Dying Activity Book, um, otherwise known as MADE, for young people who have someone in their life who may choose MADE. So these books look similar to this one on the screen, but with different activities, question and answers and ideas. Um, so for example, helping children and youth identify how they wanna spend time with the person, uh, how they wanna say their goodbyes, do they wanna read them a message, hold their hand, talk about time they spent together, um, do they want to add additional ways that maybe aren't listed in the book that they would like to um, spend some time with that person before their death. So they can mark yes or no, and they can add things on to the list that they would like to do. There's also an additional workbook called Finding Your Own Way to Grieve by Carla Halbert. Um, this is an interactive book created for children and youth with autism, and that explains death, it explores feelings that they might have, and again, it offers creative activities that can facilitate their healing. Unfortunately, there isn't a free copy of this workbook that I could find, but we can provide that link in the resources uh, following the presentation so you can take a look at it and see if it might be a right fit for you. There's also this coloring book, which is best suited for younger children, but again, no specific ages. So I re recommend that you review it in advance. That way you can familiarize yourself with the content to see if you think if it would be a good fit for them. Um, and also so you can prepare yourself for answering any questions that they might have. It's also a great way to start a conversation about deaths and what they can expect before and after a funeral. This one in particular is catered towards European American traditional funerals. So give it a read through beforehand and see if that is something that fits with your uh, cultural or religious beliefs. 
On the next two side, slides, we have a list of books from the Children and Youth Grief Network website, and it is categorized based on developmental age groups. However, again, it's important to remember, you know your children and youth best. There might be a book outside of their specific age category that fits them better. So feel free to take a look at books outside of those categories and use what you feel is the most suitable for your child or youth and their level of understanding. There's also an online children's book created by Sesame Street, and that's called Grief Something Small Storybook, and you can print it or read it using a screen as another option, so we'll provide that resource as well. We also wanted to include some books for adults because it's equally as important to learn about um, our own grief and process our own grief in order to support the children and youth in our lives. And if you're looking for more books, uh, the Bereaved Families of York Region website also provides a wonderful list of book recommendations. So you can feel free to check that one out for even more resources. So some online resources here. We have on the left side, uh, some websites that are catered towards adults who are experiencing grief and adults who are supporting others who are grieving. So you can type these names, uh, the Dougie Center, What's Your Grief, and the Children's Grief Foundation into Google um, for easy access. But we, again, will pro provide those links to you as another way to hold on to them. All of the websites include many resources to learn more about grief and loss. The Dougie Center and the What's Your Grief websites both offer fantastic podcasts for those of you who prefer to learn by listening rather than reading. You can choose the episodes that are most interesting or applicable to you. Um, and for the most part, you don't need to listen to them in any particular order. The Children's Grief Foundation has social media pages where they post tips like that example of the image on the communication slide that had the explanation of um, explaining cremation to children. So I really appreciate that um, website and those social media pages because they have some short and simple tips or pieces of information and it's not too overwhelming all at once. On the right side, there are websites catered towards youth who are experiencing grief. So Youth Grief offers advice from peers, tips and tools, as well as an art gallery for different ways of learning about grief. Teenage Grief Sucks offers stories and resources. They also have a platform where youth can share their own stories of grief, and that can be through sharing an article, a note of hope, a art piece, and that can really reduce isolation to be able to share that, um, your own experiences, as well as learning from other people's experiences online. I do suggest that you take a look at these websites before providing them to your youth so that you can determine, again, if it's a good fit for them and help support them navigating that website if they do have any questions. <laughs> I also want to highlight that there's a ton of resources that we have provided, and you will find even more when you look through these websites. So don't feel like you need to review everything and know everything there is to know about grief. It can be overwhelming if you try to access all of these different resources at the same time. So while we want to provide you with a variety of resources so that you can choose the ones that suit you and your family best, um, take a look and see which ones those are, and then you can always move on to other resources as needed. So here is a list of support services. Um, Yorktown Family Services is located on Eglinton Avenue in New York, and they provide individual and family counseling. So for children and youth, they offer in-person and outdoor, or uh, in-person and virtual programs, sorry. So the in-person ones are indoor and outdoor options, and again, that virtual support option. Their bereavement program provides therapeutic counseling support, after a death to process and normalize grief, encourage emotional expression and communication, enhance resiliency and explore helpful coping strategies. They also have the family support program, which provides opportunities to connect with the community of grievers who have experienced the death of an immediate family member through family events. So these events are developed for children and youth and their parents or caregivers to decrease to decrease that isolation through strengthening family and peer relationships and honoring and remembering the person in their life who has died. Then we have Jewish Family and Child Services of Greater Toronto, and they have a couple of locations throughout Toronto and Vaughan. So the Jewish Hospice 
program provides emotional, spiritual, financial, um, and practical support to individuals and their family members. So that might include navigating the healthcare system, caregiver relief, psychoeducation, individual and group therapeutic grief counseling, and bereavement support, which focuses on a culturally attuned approach. However, all people are welcome regardless of cultural, religious, or racial backgrounds. They do offer services in English and Russian, and uh, some current groups that I thought were interesting and wanted to highlight, uh, some for adults, navigating grief and building resiliency, a group for widow and widowers under the age of 68, as well as over the age of, 60, age of 68, and losing a parent as an adult. Some of these have costs and some are free, but they do offer a fee reduction based on the income. They also offer separation groups, so what to tell your kids when you're separating, successful step parenting, a one family, two homes, high conflict divorce, and these uh, are opportunities to learn skills to mitigate those risks from parental separation or divorce and loss via that uh, separation. Then we have Bereaved Families of Ontario York Region, which is located in Newmarket and they offer non-therapeutic individual peer support for ages 18 plus and group peer support for adults as well. So some of those are open or closed groups, open where you can join in at any time and anyone is welcome who has lost a loved one. In the closed groups, they have specific topics. So you need to register for these ones in advance. And those topics include child loss, spousal and partner loss and parental loss. They also offer community-based group healing supports for those ages 55 plus and some community outreach programs. They also have children and youth supports. So um, again, that's a peer support model. And um, in the past, in 2023, they had art expression grief healing supports for ages nine to 17. However, you'll need to um, keep up on their website to see those services that they may be offering in 2024 for children and youth. The last one here is Season Center for Grieving Children, which is located in Barrie, um, where they have children, youth, adult, and community programs. So again, all programs are also based on a peer, peer support model. They have groups for specific areas of loss. So for children, those groups are death of a sibling, death of a parent, suicide, substance use related death, um, and for adults, they are death of a caregiver, death of a child, death of a spouse or life partner, and caregiving on your own. They also offer school programs, so that includes teacher consultations and class support and first response support due to a death, or community outreach, which includes celebration of life events, presentations and workshops, as well as a camp for children ages six to 16. And this is a six night overnight camp for children and youth who are grieving the death of a parent or sibling. So there are additional organizations that don't offer specific grief support. However, they can offer support with other mental health concerns and grief can be a topic of conversation during that support process. So some of those other agencies include Catholic Community Services of York Region, New Path, York Hills, Hong Fook, and Canark as well. Um, so I just recommend that you take a look on their websites depending on where they're located or if they have um, virtual or in person and what specific topics they may cover to see what is the best fit for you and your family. So that is all from us. I'm going to stop sharing and we can move into our Q&A. Thank you so much, Alexandra and Megan. That was an incredibly um, informative, comprehensive presentation. So I certainly appreciate all the information that you provided to our families and caregivers this evening.